Hello, I'm Audrey Tang, Taiwan's Digital Minister. I'm really happy to be here at the 11th Forum FemCat to talk about digital quarantine in Taiwan. In Taiwan, our counter-COVID started on the first day of 2020. We did not declare a state of emergency at any point this time, but we did start health inspections for all flight passengers coming in from Wuhan to Taiwan, essentially playing the SARS playbook that we learned in 2003 when SARS first hit Taiwan. And so as part of that health inspection work, we started to devise a system that across all agencies will link the data together to foster not only border control, but also tracing and testing, medical care and decision support. And the decision task force is by the CECC or the Central Epidemic Command Center um, as hosted by the Minister of Health and Welfare with the commander of the CECC, the Minister Chen Shizhong. And so because of the CECC's design, it has the lawful power to link not only all the data together, but also have secondments from pretty much all the ministries and to assume the ultimate responsibility to declare such data linkages. As you will learn, this enabled us to counter the pandemic with no lockdown and also without any emergency declarations. First of all, when we talk about digital technology, we think about the connection of people to people. When we deploy AI, we think about assistive intelligence, not authoritarian intelligence. So reducing the chore, the time it takes for the frontline public service to do their work, to increase mutual trust through transparency and accountability, as well as to reduce the risk of everyone involved by making sure that each particular ministry only have access to the private details, the personal data on an as needed basis. These are all important pillars in the design of the digital quarantine system. From the entry, uh, each visitor to Taiwan see this border control registration card on which um, they're asked of their SIM card, their number of their telephone. And we use that on cell phone tower triangulation in partnership with the five major telecoms to make sure that during the next 14 days of quarantine, if the visitor choose to quarantine at home, we can uh, make sure that they have fulfilled their duty of quarantining and also uh, reimburse their time uh, for this quarantine effort at around 100 euros per day for 14 days. It's a stipend. On the other hand, we do send them a quarantine notice and say, by the authorization of Communicable Disease Act, if you break out of the quarantine, then you'll be fined up to 1,000 times that, which is why pretty much nobody, uh, less than 1%, I believe, uh, do break the quarantine and pay the fine. Now, the quarantine care is as important as the tracking system to ensure that people feel um, comfortable and by themselves for 14 days. So the local administration in the local civil affairs bureau takes care of meal delivery, garbage collection, uh, checking out uh, and making sure that uh, you're feeling well. The local health authorities are in charge of calling an ambulance uh, if an emergency situation occurs, uh, medical care arrangement, and our development of telecare, that is to say, uh, the diagnosis and for uh, mental health also, and physical health over video conference is also very well developed thanks to our policy of broadband as human rights. Indeed, anywhere in Taiwan, no matter where your phone is, um, you're enjoying at least 10 megabits per second broadband connectivity over 4G or 5G network. Um, and the 4G part is very affordable. It's just 16 euros per month for unlimited data connection. If you don't have that, 
it's my fault, right? So with the universal broadband coverage and the universal healthcare coverage, people feel safe, even if they start developing COVID-like symptoms, for they understand there will be no social or financial hardships if they um, speak truthfully to the medical workers taking care of them. And now the local government and Central Epidemic Command Center, they do have access if someone breaks out of the quarantine. There are three different uh, levels of data collection going on. First of all, we use a chatbot, an automated um, line bot. Line is an end-to-end -end encrypted chat channel like WhatsApp uh, that periodically the bot will check on you, ask how you feel, uh, what's your temperature, do you have any improvement suggestions to the system, would you like to know more about COVID uh, and things like that. And in a way, uh, it makes sure that people get access to the information that they need. But if they don't respond to the chatbot, there's also two-way SMS and even phone calls from the local officials. It's also two-way. Anyone who feels um, uncomfortable with any part of this journey is free to call 1922 uh, and get a point-by-point -point explanation of the epidemiological reasons as well as the design and also their data rights. And they also have the local officials taking care of the day-to-day -day needs as previously explained. But if they do venture out, then the alarm SMS is sent, first only to their phone, reminding them uh, to go back, but then gradually escalating to the local officials who will then check their whereabouts. And if they check on your whereabouts and you're gone, well, it's sent to the police. And so because of this, people understand that if they break out of the quarantine, they'll actually get caught very, very quickly. And that's the digital fence. Now, of course, uh, the guidelines for using of such contact information data is very important. People understand that the CDC, the Communicable Diseases uh, Control Center, only have the legal authorization to keep that for 28 days or four weeks. After four weeks, everything needs to be deleted from the data processes. People also understand, uh, as part of this clear informed rights, uh, who exactly is processing such data because the telecoms are the one that sends out the SMS. The five telecoms already collects the signal strength information anyway. It's not like they send it to some other data processes. So the cybersecurity parameter is clearer. And also it must only be used for this particular purpose and never for say selling advertisements or any other uh, purpose unrelated to the CDC's mission. And all this is very clearly explained on this QR code in the CDC website. So what are the success factors? I would say that the deliberate choice of going with the triangulation, which may be quite imprecise, actually, maybe only on a block level, certainly not as precise as GPS, is nevertheless an advantage. For if we enabled mandatory GPS collection, then it's hyper-precise. People will feel very uncomfortable. And also because it's a new data collection point, the privacy and cybersecurity implications is unknown. On the other hand, the cell phone tower signal strength triangulation is already used in Taiwan for disaster warnings. If there's an earthquake, people receive a location-based earthquake warning SMS uh, seconds before the actual earthquake is felt. We also send similar warnings on the SMS level for flood evacuation. So people understand that this will not say, interfere with their application level data. And people also understand that this does not enable a more finely detailed control um, as would any new technology actually uh, get people worried. So we didn't use GPS or Bluetooth or Wi-Fi or any other new data collection points. We rely strictly on what's already being collected. We also respect the privacy norms and democratic accountability. Because we never declare an emergency state, the parliament need to pre-approve, pre-authorize all the actions that I just listed here. 
So, in addition to the formal authorization of the act uh, enabling such emergency responses and a special budget, each legislator can get a public hearing or interpolation going on. So, when we first roll out the digital fence system uh, around February, people are okay with it, but people still have their doubts. The approval rate um, stayed at around 90% for quite a while. But after a public hearing was done and the Department of Cybersecurity, uh, which is the architect of this whole system, explained on public record to all the MPs of the legislature, the uh, approval rate grew from around 90% to 94%. Of course, we still thank the other 6% for they keep us honest and accountable. So with regard of our GDPR adequacy requirements, our legal compliance um, acts and epidemic management requirements, we make sure that we all act on the sense of proportion, a heuristic that's based on the familiarity in both the technology and the privacy norms. So um, thank you for listening. And this is indeed a, a group work. As you can see here, many actors, both in the public sector, in the academia, in the telecommunication companies and so on, all contributed toward this common goal. And I would argue that it is because we have learned the institutional lesson in 2003 in SARS, when the central government and the municipal government were saying completely different things. It was very chaotic. We had to lockdown an entire hospital unannounced and so on. So that followed the chaos of 2003. In 2004, we institutionalized this all of society response strategy and have kept it fresh with yearly drills. So when SARS 2.0 or COVID-19 came, thanks to Dr. Li Wenliang warning us on the social media in uh, December 31st in 2019, we enabled this entire system in just a matter of a few days. And so this quick response, rapid response, uh, coupled with a radically transparent attitude of democratic accountability, I think that's what brings these technologies to the people rather than asking people to blindly follow the technology. And this is going to be very important to the worldwide response to our upcoming challenges, uh, be it infodemic or the pandemic, maybe SARS 3.0. Nobody knows whether it will come a year or 10 years from now. So I would advise all of you to learn what we have learned this time in COVID-19 and design the institutions of both the legal mandates as well as the technological designs that people feel comfortable after a careful public deliberation and deploy it for the next pandemic. Thank you for listening and I wish you live long and prosper.